Hello and welcome to this week's YouTube video, which is all about my pet portrait painting process, which is quite a tongue twister. I am just about coming to an end of my Christmas commissions for this year, and they have all been pet portraits this time around, which is has been really lovely. So I thought while I'm on a pet portrait painting roll, I shall continue that onto YouTube. And today I'm going to be painting Benji, who's had his portrait done by me many times already in lots of different styles. Today I'm going to paint him again onto this five by seven inch cotton canvas. I've already done a couple things to this, so I shall discuss that in a bit. But that's the plan today. I'm going to paint Benji and I'm going to share my process with you. And, um, yeah, that's about it, so let's get into that. Quick side note before we get started. My painting process has changed a lot over the years and it is still changing today. So the way that I paint now is not the way that I painted a couple of months ago and it's not the way I'm probably going to be painting in a few months time. This is how I'm painting at the moment and it's what works for me now, but it is likely to change. It is a flexible thing. The painting I'm going to be working on today is one that I have actually attempted once before. And one of the first things that I do when I am creating a pet portrait is I measure it up and make sure it is the same dimensions as my canvas. So the canvas I am using is five by seven inches. And the very first thing that I did with this was I added gesso, a layer of gesso, which I don't need to do because this comes pre-primed and ready to go. So I could have just painted on it the only reason I add gesso is because I have seen other artists add gesso to their work. So um, I wanted to see if it did make a difference to the paint. So I've been trialing it and experimenting a little bit, but I don't have the results of that experiment yet. I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but I'm doing it out of habit now. So I added a thin layer of gesso. I let that dry for about 24 hours and then I lightly sanded it and then I was ready to start the process. This colour here that you can see is burnt sienna and it is just acrylic paint. I use water mixable oils, but for this initial layer, I have been trialing using acrylic. It dries a little bit faster. I can put it on in one coat and then I can paint over the top with water mixable oils. I won't be using any more acrylic paint from now on. That is the only, the, uh, the only thing that is acrylic here. From this point on, it's just water mixable oils. As far as I am aware, you can put oils over the top of acrylic, but you can't put acrylic over the top of oils. So that is the end of acrylic. So I usually start my pet portrait commissions with a grid. Now I know not everybody likes to use grids and that's absolutely fine. But for me, if I'm working on a commission or a larger piece, then I really like to start out with a grid. I still get some freehand practice in when I'm working on studies or something a little bit more simple because it is a skill I would like to develop. But for commissions, it's usually easier just to do a grid and then I know everything's going to be in the right place before I start adding any level of detail. So here I am just doing a really rough outline and plotting in where all of the main features are going to be. I'm not adding a huge amount of detail here because that will come in the painting. So I have just finished the sketch and now I'm ready to start painting. Now my approach at the moment is pretty different to what I was doing before. I used to work on the whole painting and kind of bring it together, work from large shapes to small shapes. I've tried lots of different ways of doing this and at the moment I approach each section at a time and I bring it to completion and then I move on to the next part. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Now there are pitfalls of doing this. It's not <laughs> for everybody and I don't know how long I will continue to do this. It's working for me at the moment and I'm enjoying it, but there are some issues with it. So when you're working on just one section at a time, there is the risk that you might make your painting look a little bit disjointed. So if I'm working on the left ear and I do it all and then I move on to the right ear and I don't get my values quite right, they might not sit well together and they might look like separate paintings that have just kind of been stitched together. Whereas if you work on the whole thing all together, you're kind of bringing it together the entire time you're painting. So I mean, if that makes any sense, I'm maybe not explaining that well, but one thing to look out for if you do paint in this way is to try and make sure that the whole thing sits well together and it doesn't look really disjointed. But that's probably enough talking for now. Let's get into the actual painting and I will demonstrate what I mean. 
The colours I have on my palette are Titanium White, Ultramarine Blue, Cerulean Blue, Dioxazine Purple, Alizarin Crimson, Cadmium Red Light, Burnt Sienna, Raw Umber, Yellow Ochre, Cadmium Yellow, Lemon Yellow, Naples Yellow, Ivory Black, Phthalo Green and Sap Green. I also use some Gamblin Solvent Free Gel as my medium for this painting. The only reason I'm mentioning the colours is I thought maybe people might be interested in the palette, but I didn't end up using all of these and you definitely don't need this amount of paint in order to create a nice portrait. I've gotten into the habit of laying my colours out in this way, so I tend to put the same things on my palette, but I didn't use all of the paint here and you could definitely do something like this with a much reduced palette. So as I mentioned earlier, I like to work in sections at the moment and I decided to start with the ear that appears on our left. It's nice just to isolate one particular area and for some reason I always tend to start with the left ear and I work on that until that ear is pretty much complete and then I'll move on to another part of the portrait. With each section I tend to follow a similar pattern so I start with the darkest areas first and then I gradually build up to the highlights. When you're working on individual sections, it's important to keep in mind what the whole painting's going to look like all together. So before I did this, I had a look at the reference photo and I determined where the darkest areas were going to be and the brightest highlights. So the highlights are going to be in places like the eye, there is a teensy bit on the nose and on the muzzle, and the darkest areas are the nostrils and the edges of the eyes. So I don't want to use my darkest or my brightest tones anywhere else on the painting, I want to save them specifically for those areas. So so as a result, I'm not adding too much contrast into these ears. When you're painting black fur, it can be tempting to use ivory black straight out of the tube and maybe just add a little bit of white and work kind of grayscale. But when you look at the fur properly, it's very rarely just black or gray. There's so many colors in Benji's fur. There's some reds, we've got some burnt siennas around the fluff on the top of his ears. There's a bit of phthalo green and some blue in those shadows. There's some purple tones. Along the bottom edge of the ear, there's a little bit of green in there, which I think is reflecting the grass. So there's all kinds of colors in the fur. It's not just black. And I try and reflect that in the paint that I add on so it adds a little bit more interest. I was having a few technical difficulties with the camera so I tried to do a little bit of a close-up here so you can see some of the colors. After the ears I usually like to move on to the eyes but first I paint the surroundings before I get to the eye so even though I've done a grid there is a chance that this eye is not going to be in the right place so by painting the surrounding first I can make sure that the eye is going to be exactly where I need it to be rather than putting in loads of detail into the eye and then realizing I placed it wrong and having to get rid of it and start again. Again, I'm working from dark to light and I'm using the same colors that I used for the ear, which will hopefully tie the painting together a little better. I don't tend to pre-mix a lot of my colors. I just mix them as I go along and then make small alterations to them. I don't have the patience for doing a lot of pre-mixing, so I like to do it this way. But if I make enough, it means that I can use it again later in the painting and that's gonna hopefully tie everything together rather than remixing things for each individual section, which might not really help with cohesiveness. So I'm very quickly sharing an additional part of my pet portrait painting process, which is the struggles of doing it in the winter when the lighting is not very good. I'm currently sitting here with the light on so that I can see because it's so dark outside that even though I'm by a window, I can't see this at all. And also when I'm filming it, the light reflects on it and it's a bit difficult to work with. So I guess part of the process is trying to deal with your surroundings and the limitations of, um, of painting in the winter time in the dark. Here is a close-up just so you can see how some of that paint is lying down. I really like the texture of the paint and this is why I like painting in this way and just doing a tiny bit at a time. For the eye, I begin by outlining the edges just to make sure that I have it in the right place. I do end up moving this eye because despite building up the surroundings first, I still had it slightly too low down, 
But anyway, I begin by outlining with the darkest colour first and then I use a kind of base coat just to cover the eye itself. This is a pretty dark mixture. I think there's raw umber and burnt sienna in there and that's just going to form the base of the eye. And then I'm going to build up some of some highlights around that. So I'm using some burnt sienna and yellow ochre and a teensy bit of red, I think, to make it a bit more orange. And I'm just putting in the highlights now and outlining the lighter parts of the eye. I'm trying to add a little bit more detail than I used to when I was painting in a slightly looser style, but I still don't want to put every single thing that I see in there. I want to keep some painterly effects, so I'm just trying to add as much detail as I need to to make it realistic and not any more than that. Adding the highlight is always my favourite part. It's what brings the whole eye together, so I really enjoy that bit. Throughout the majority of this painting, I use a pretty tiny brush. This is a flat brush, or at least it started out as a flat brush, but I've used it so much the edges have rounded a little bit. Now, I used to want to paint in a really loose style, and I really admire artists who have that really painterly effect with their paintings, and so traditionally I would use a much larger brush for something like this, and then gradually work my way down to the smaller one to start adding in some of the detail. But I found in my quest for loose paintings, I was getting a little bit lazy in my approach, and I was rushing through the process trying to be really expressive Impressive, but I wasn't really spending the time to make sure the painting actually looked how I wanted it to and had the level of detail that I was really striving for. My temporary solution to that is to get more detailed and start using a smaller brush. Now this is counterintuitive to everything that I have been taught so far but it's actually working for me and I am finding that I'm enjoying the process a lot more working like this. For the second eye, I repeated the process from the first, which was fairly straightforward. I only tend to add one teensy tiny little bit of titanium white for the highlight in the eye because that does the job and I find you don't really need much more than that. And then it was time to move on to the nose and then I got to my darkest colour. So the nostril there I think is probably the darkest part of the entire painting. So I really wanted that to stand out and be obviously the deepest shadow. It was during this stage of the painting that I started to notice some of my values weren't quite right, which brings me to another important part of this pet portrait painting process. When you're working section by section, it's really important every now and then to take a step back and look at the work as a whole so that you don't get too caught up in the fine details without looking at how the whole portrait is coming together. When I'd finished the nose, I looked at the painting and I felt like the highlights weren't as bright as they needed to be. The space in between Benji's eyes and some of the highlights on the nose were just a little bit too dark for me. So I decided to take a break. I paused for the day because it was getting ridiculously dark outside and the lighting was really terrible for painting. So I took a break, I looked at the painting from a different perspective and then I decided to revisit it the next day and to correct those mistakes. One thing I do if I'm struggling with the values is I take a photo of my painting and I put it into black and white and I compare this with a black and white version of my reference photo and then it's really easy to see whether my values are working or they're pretty terrible and that way I know what I need to correct. I realised looking at this that I needed to brighten the area across the forehead and brighten some of the highlights so that it looked a little bit better. So in the next part of this video, you will see me revisiting some of those sections and just trying to add a little bit more light there so that they don't look so dark. Now typically I don't like to do this when I'm working a la prima because I don't want the paint to get really tacky and then have to work over the top of it. So I prefer to do things in one go. Because it was quite chilly overnight while I left the painting, it was still workable the next day so I could add some highlights on top without too much difficulty but my preference would be to just get it right the first time, but we can't always do that. I just mixed up some slightly lighter versions of the colour, a little bit lighter than I thought I would need, and then I put it on the top of the paint I already laid down. Because it's still kind of mixing with that bottom layer, it's probably going to get a bit darker anyway, so I felt like I could go a teensy bit lighter with my colours, knowing that they would then tone down once I added it to the painting. <laughs> 
I added a little bit more blue to the paint in between Benji's eyes because I noticed that it was blue in the reference photo reflecting the sky probably, so I really kicked that up a notch so that it was more obvious in this painting. And although I'm working with a smaller brush, I'm not trying to draw every individual hair and every individual whisker here. I do want to add a bit more detail in my paintings now, but I don't want to go to that level just because it's not something that I really like to do in my paintings. I like to try and achieve some realism while still keeping a painterly look, so I'm bearing that in mind as I'm adding the paint around his muzzle. In this section I am following the same rule of working from dark to light, so initially I lay down a slightly darker colour than what I want this area to be, and then I'll get lighter and lighter and place that paint over the top. I don't cover all of that undercoat when I put the lighter tones on top so you can still see some of that dark colour shining through and I feel like that gives the painting a little bit of extra depth. When I'm adding the white colour here, I'm not using straight titanium white. I am creating a mixture that's a little bit toned down so that it's not too bright. I think with this I use a little bit of the blue and grey mixture that I've been using in the fur just to tone the white down a little bit. I put a little bit of Naples yellow in there if I wanted to brighten it up somewhat. I used a teensy tiny amount of pure titanium white to go over some teensy bits of fur but only in a few select areas and not all the way around the muzzle. Once I finished with Benji's face, I moved on to the rest of his body and I was a little bit looser with how I painted this and not quite so strict about adding in the detail. When people look at this portrait, I want the main focus to be Benji's face, so I don't mind about putting so much detail in the rest of the fur. Instead, I worked as normal from dark to light and I was a little less concerned about making things look completely accurate. I just wanted to give the feeling of fur with the paint. And to do this, I try and paint in the direction that the fur that would be going anyway, so that it has that movement of fur without having to draw each individual hair. I just drag my brush in the direction that the hair is pointing and that usually does a pretty good job. One of the reasons I'm enjoying painting in this way at the moment is because I don't have a huge amount of patience and I think building a painting up in layers takes a lot of patience because you can't see the end result for a long time whereas doing this you get to see a nice finished ear and then a nice finished nose and it gradually comes together and I really enjoy that quicker gratification of this style of painting. For the collar I kept things fairly simple, I didn't want to put a lot of detail here because I want the main focus to be around his face, so I just roughly outlined it with the main colours and then I drew in some little paw prints which he has on his collar, but in a very loose style, I don't really mind how this looks, this can be a bit more painterly, so I enjoyed doing that bit, it didn't really take a huge amount of time. And one of my favourite parts of painting collars is painting the shiny little rings on them because I love the effect of shininess in paintings. I did this in a couple of layers so I just put a darker version of the ring down first and then I put a slightly brighter highlight and then I added a teensy bit of titanium white for the brightest spot on the collar. I change my approach to backgrounds depending on the subject, so if there is a really interesting background that's obviously part of the piece then I will paint it in a bit more detail, but usually I will just get some of the main colours from the background and use that to influence the portrait. So I didn't draw all of the things behind Benji here, but I did get the vague colours right so he sits well in his environment. Benji's fur will reflect his environment, so I try and keep the colours the same as what I can see in the reference photo so that it looks like he sits well in that position rather than he's superimposed onto a separate background. I also use a brush to brush some of Benji's fur out into the background so that he sits nicely in it rather than looking like a cutout. It helps to have a bit of cohesiveness between the subject and the background rather than just painting right up to the edges and then not working on the edges anymore, if that makes any sense. Usually when I add the background, the paint of the fur is still pretty wet so that it blends nicely together rather than looking like there's a rigid outline. If the painting was going to take me a longer amount of time, I probably work some of the background in at the same time just to avoid that cutout look. Once the background was done, we were complete. I ended up painting the edges of this green just so it matched the background, but I guess you can do what you like with the edges. You don't need to paint them if you don't want to. 
I really like how this turned out and I really enjoyed this process. I hope you've enjoyed watching along too. Please leave this video a thumbs up if you liked it and consider subscribing if you want more art related content. Feel free to leave a comment and thank you so much for watching all the way through to this part of the video. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here and I will see you next time.